During the 1950s, General Motors dominated the automotive landscape. They did it through engineering, innovation, design, style, production. And half of all the new cars sold in the 1950s was a GM product. Now, despite all their abilities, all their power, all their might, GM wasn't able to provide new car buyers one simple thing, and that was a small car option. That was until 1960 with the introduction of the Chevy Corvair. So I'm in the back lot of the garage that I'm renting and I realize over the winter time how much of a dump hole this place has become. And this is somewhat of an appropriate place to film because the Urban Dictionary defines the word Corvair the same exact way. Now, I think it's unfair. I think the car is misunderstood and I'm actually enjoying it much more than I really thought I would. This is a 1963 Corvair Mazda. It's the high spec sporty model of the Corvair. And I, I bought this car a year ago, but just recently got it on the road and running again. Let me show you around the car a little bit, and you tell me if the Urban Dictionary got this thing right or wrong. So Corvair ran for 10 years, 1960 to 1969, two generations. The first was from 60 to 64, the second generation, 65 to 69. 1.8 million of these were made during that time. Now, instead of calling them first generation, second generation, they go by early model, late model. Now, 1963, this car, 284,000 of these were made. Half of them were Mazdas, and with the Mazdas, you get, you know, the, the bucket seats and the fancy interior, the chrome trim and things like that. Now, that seems like a lot of cars, but compared to what Chevrolet was producing that year for full size, they made 1.5 million full size Chevys. Now, all Corvairs have the same configuration. They're all rear wheel drive, rear engined, air cooled with a flat six engine. There's different engine options throughout the years there's also different horsepower ratings going from 80 as the lowest up to 180 on the corvairs there was also multiple versions there was a different corvair for every need that you may have there was a, a sedan version the two-door coupe as well there was a van there was a pickup truck there was also a station wagon called a lakewood now these are quirky weird cars i get it but i'm going to tell you i adore these things something i enjoy so much about it is that roof line it's like uh it's something they started in 1959 at least chevrolet did with the skinny a pillars and skinny c pillars kind of make a floating roof and now full-size chevys they stopped doing the bubble top look in 62 but they kept it going with corvair until the end of the early model run this car was a disaster when i first bought it it was sitting on a trailer. I don't think it's been run or on the road in literally decades. But what I liked about it, first was the styling. I, I mean, I just, I really like it. I, I dig the stainless trim that goes around the windows. And it's just, there's a lot of coolness going on here. The interior was super cool. I love the two-tone, the red and the white. But mechanically, this thing was a mess. But I thought the car had some potential to look really good and get back on the road again. And I thought it was worth spending some money on. And that I did. I paid $2,500 for a non-running car sitting on the trailer. But it was mostly complete. There was no rust on the body and all the trim was there and the interior was together. It was filthy. But it took another $4,000 to get this thing to the condition that it is in today not talking about cosmetics at all this is simply all the mechanical pieces that it needed to get back on the road again now this car was in a hoopty status at different points of its lifespan meaning that the cost of something as simple as a brake job far outweighed the value of the car itself and so what you ended up getting were shade tree mechanics backyard mechanics doing hack jobs on trying to keep cars like this on the road again and it took a mother load of effort to to fix all that and I quickly understood that I was outside the realm of my abilities, my understanding, my, my skill set. And so I found a Corvair expert 
near here, Wilmington, uh, maybe 15 minutes from here. And he, all he does is specialize on Corvairs. And the shop's name is Corvair Therapy. And he just tore this thing up. Now in the glove compartment are the receipts that it took to get this thing back on the road again. And it was all kinds of things like issues with the manifold, the latch buttons, the belly pan, the mufflers, the muffler straps, oil change, car rebuilds of course, brakes and hoses and washers and on and on and on. The number of items that it required was extensive. And all totaled, it was $1,700 in labor at $25 an hour and then another $1,463 in parts and oil and so forth. I spent another $500 on tires and a few other things. What's fun about this car, and this is what I enjoy so much about these, these finds, is some of the documentation that I get with it. And in here is the original owner's manual, along with a whole bunch of other receipts from the history of the car from a brake service in 1976. A visit to the garage in 1977 for a whopping $21 for a fan belt, muffler hanger, and clamps. I've got a history of vehicle registrations going back to, to the early 70s. But what I think is the coolest part of all of this is the original bill of sale for the car from A.D. Anderson Chevrolet in Baltimore, Maryland. Not well optioned given the Mazda status of it. It does have a power glide for $156, a two-speed automatic. There was a convenience group spare tire wheel lock the upgraded engine the 102 horsepower engine and then there's the oil bath air cleaner which gives um pre-filtration before it gets to the the paper element all told this car cost a whopping 2368 dollars now for that 2300 dollars that you spent on your brand new car you didn't get a whole lot in here you do get an ashtray right in the center look at that and down here is your transmission shifter there is no park setting you have low drive neutral reverse if you're familiar with chevrolets you can take the key out uh, it's just weird you have a lighter 60 almost 65,000 miles here is your warning lights one for engine temperature and one for a generator there you go and then your wiper button over here turns on your wiper and then your washer and then your headlights for parking and lights down below you have your parking brake handle it's essential that these things work simply because there's no park setting on the transmission you remember these yep and then you have your air vent right here for your foot vent area right there and over here you have your fan controls low medium high heat or no heat that's what you get that's your option air is simply uh recirculating versus bringing in um outside air the froster setting on your mirror get a, uh, a low beam high beam and over on the doors of course you have your window cranks and you have your door handle you have vent windows thank you very much these at some point need to make a return back into the car manufacturing process you have pretty cool bucket seats these things are stiff and hard and I'm wondering if I can soften these up through moisturizing them I'm not sure it took a lot of cleaning to get these back together again in the back I mean it's tight and cramped there's the amount of legroom that you get back here. You do get ashtrays. And one cool feature is this seat flips down to a package shelf. How cool is that? I, I didn't know that was a thing back in 1963, but apparently it is. Up top, you get a dome light, which is kind of worn and crusty. You get a little bit of crust and mold. And you know, I did that. I did that when I was ripping out the interior, pulling out the seats to get them cleaned up. I just destroyed that and I, I don't know if I want to repair that or fix it or just leave it as it is. And that makes a point in that, how far do I want to go with this car? I haven't even washed it in the year that I've had it. It's filthy, disgusting, dirty. I don't know if it's been cleaned or detailed, you know, at any point in its life since it was fairly new. And I don't think I want to either. I don't think the world needs another restored Corvair. And uh, I'm having a good time just leaving it out in the rain, driving it whenever I want, not caring about it and just enjoying it as it is. All right, out back, you see right here the cross flags on here? That is how Chevy designated any type of engine upgrade. So in this era, if you had a base engine, you would just get the Corvair logo. Uh, if you got the engine upgrade, like this has the 102 horsepower, you get the cross flag. Now Chevy did this with everything. They did this with their full-size cars too. Under here, the license plate, there's a button right here that you push and it pops the hood or trunk. It locks in place 
and this is where all the time and all the effort was spent on this car. This is where the spare tire would go, but we pulled that out uh, just to save some weight. Rebuilt carburetors, uh, tune-up, everything under here, ground straps and so forth. All the tins on this car, there's something like 17 pieces of tin that encapsulate the engine. So this cooling fan, when it sucks air in, it can channel the cooling air into the right places. Uh, it's all been pulled off. The engine and the heads and the cylinders were deburred. Uh, in order to get more cooling air and all the, the rat nest and everything else that was in there was pulled out And you can also see down here the new wiring harnesses as well Something I always wondered about cars with louvers is how do these louvers work? And this is a, a really interesting process if you take a look at the louvers right here The rain would go into these louvers. There's a channel in here. This is the channel You can see the louvers right there. The water would run in here. It would come out through here and right along this drip rail right here and just fall right down. I thought that was kind of cool. Never knew how that worked. And so, you know, it's not perfect, but you know, it doesn't catch fire and uh, it's an enjoyable, reliable car. So up front, you swing this thing open, you pop the key in and, and there is the frunk, I guess. Here's a spare tire that belongs on something else. And there was a big oil mess in here. Oil spilled all over the place, but you can see what's going on. You have your washer bottle, your your um, brake reservoir, uh, wiper motor, and then your headlights, and there's a, a refill bottle over here for your washer reservoir, your jack, and in here is a bunch of parts, things that I took off the car, and um, I think I'm gonna touch these up, get some model paint, and you know recolor these and get them back on the car again. Again, more wiring issues that were all addressed on this car. Here's a spare belt. You always have to have a spare belt with a Corvair. And then your jacking instructions, which is really cool to see. I love this retro old stuff. And with the tire back in, get that closed. There we go. All right, with that said, why don't we hop in the car? We'll go for a drive and I'll tell you a little more about it. With the new weather stripping on these doors, you really have to slam them hard to get them closed. And getting out of that tight spot back there, you realize just how maneuverable this car is. I mean, the wheel whips around so easy, it's so effortless. It's light too. The car's like 2,800 pounds. The majority of the weight is in the back. There's no power steering, no power brakes. It wasn't even available on these cars. And honestly, you don't need it. You really don't. The handles so well and it's so effortless. The other thing with these Corvairs, because it's air-cooled engine, the heat that you get uh, when you turn the heater on, it comes from the heat that's trapped between the engine block and the tins that wrap around the engine. So any type of smells or oils leaks or stains or whatever finds its way into the cabin. And so you got to make sure you drop the window every time you drive so the, uh, the, the smell, the exhaust gases and so forth doesn't permeate into your clothes and your hair and, and you smell like a, a car engine all day long. And now once you get through all of that, you realize just how fun this car is, man. It's really small, but that makes it super nimble. It <laughs> whoa, a little squirrely. Now with the swing axle rear, uh, when you make these quick turns and maneuvers, you'll find the inside wheel will buckle in like that and it creates insane amount of oversteer. And so you really gotta balance the tire pressure between the front and the rear. GM says 11 pound differential between the front and the rear. You need 11 pounds more in the rear. And that helps control some of that oversteer, but you really feel it when you're taking these long off ramps that like fast sweeps like this, and you're turning, you're turning, you're adding more power and speed, and all of a sudden it just wants to jerk in real fast like this on you. And you gotta back off the gas pedal and, and steer correct and straighten it up again. And it, it straightens up super quick and easy. It's not a big deal, but it's just something you gotta be really aware of. In 1960, the Corvair was the Motor Trend Car of the Year, and that was because of all the engineering feats required to get this in production and get it out to the public. It did not take the award for the sales leader, though. That went to the Ford Falcon, who sold 435,000 units that year. 
Corvair sold 250,000 or so. The Valiant, which was also new in 1960, sold 200,000. Chevy was super proud of this car. They created a promotional video showing some of the cool features about the car. But what they really focused on in this promotion was the traction, the stability, that the Corvair could take you places that the other two, the Valiant and the Falcon, couldn't. If you're like most people who are interested in the Corvair, you want to know what it can do in action, out on the road. You want proof that the Corvair can deliver the goods, give you more of what you're looking for in a compact car. Now watch the Corvair prove that it's got the power, the traction, the stamina to go just about anywhere. if I want to be involved in a rollover crash in this car, especially no seat belts, and you're on your own, it's all metal around you. But, you know, it makes a point that these things are built pretty strong, pretty durable, they're robust, and, uh, you know, it's just a lot of fun to drive. Now, even though I'm $6,500 into this car, it's not perfect, obviously, aside from the cosmetics. There's some issues that popped up in the past week or so that we just realized. The first is the speedometer doesn't work. And in fact, the speedometer does work, the needle's missing. There's no needle on the speedometer gauge. I got a spare, so I can scavenge some parts off this and get that needle working again. Not a problem. And secondly, I'm leaking differential fluid from the rear axles, and so I need to put in new rear axle seals. Is that how to take care of the leak? I'm not too worried about that. And then the gas gauge recently stopped working. It's just not registering. Now the needle does move back and forth when you turn the ignition on and off. I got to research on the service manual to see what that means. Uh, but it was working earlier and as everything was fine with it. It's a, grand, a brand new gas tank, a brand new sending unit. I don't know what the issue is. And then lastly, this is the most frustrating part. I'm getting a lean condition. It doesn't happen all the time. I put maybe 200 miles on this car in this time that I had it. Uh, but it leans out to the point where it starts stumbling and there's no throttle response. And then within a couple minutes, it clears up again. I don't know if that's a fuel issue. Uh, I just don't know yet. Uh, one time, it stalled to the point where it wouldn't restart. Uh, it's at the DMV too. Super embarrassing to get the car registered and it stalled out right in line. Not a big deal. Uh, it could be the venting of the gas cap. It could be a lot of different things. I don't know quite sure what it is. Uh, the problem is it's inconsistent and I can't reproduce it when I want to. And so when I do different things like take the gas cap off, I mean, it's, it starts up again, but I don't know if that's a gas cap or if that's something else. Regardless, it's something I gotta figure out. Think about the Corvair. Does it match the Urban Dictionary's definition of it? For me, I think it's a cool little car. It's spirited, it's fun, it handles great, it's efficient, it's easy to get parts for, and you know, I think it's a low cost way to get into the old car hobby too. So I hope you enjoyed some time with me and the car, learning about the car, and uh, enjoying it with me. And as always, I'll see you on the next video. <laughs>